John D. Armand with the Cochia Valley Sword Group, and today we're going to be talking about the first article in the Heio Sancho Bocasio. Uh, so let's go ahead and begin. Uh, first article, why I call this the Way of Two Swords. I name this way Two Swords and let students train with two swords in their hands. The left hand has less importance thereby. With this method, they learn to wield the sword with one hand. The advantages of this style are apparent on the battlefield, when riding horses, in a pond or river, on a narrow path, on a stony surface, in a crowd, and when running. Therefore, when a man has a weapon in the left hand, and it is impossible to wield the sword with both hands, he must hold it in one. The one-handed handling of a sword may at first be difficult, but later it will be possible to use the sword freely without hindrance. For example, through the training, uh, through training, the necessary strength for archery is attained, and through training, the necessary strength for riding. Also, with regard to the skill of people, the mariner attains strength for the rudder and the oars, and the farmer the great strength for the plow and the hoe. In the same way, we can, with constant training, attain the necessary strength to control the sword with one hand. But it is important that each individual choose a suitable sword for his strength because there are people of greater or lesser strength. So, um, just like in the intro, Musashi's setting out kind of the, the basic bits of information. You know, why, why Nito Ryu, right? Why, why is this a uh, two-sword thing, and what does it really mean? Um, it's worth noting here that in... Uh, traditional Japanese parlance, um, sword doesn't just mean like uh, katana, like a full-length sword. Uh, the word sword is used uh, universally from the largest nodachai to, you know, the smallest little kaiken tanto, right? They're, they're all swords in the, the Japanese mindset. Um, so let's break down some of the, the further stuff that's happening here. You know, he begins by talking about using swords in both hands um, and mentions specifically that the left hand has less importance. So what does that mean? Um, does it mean we can't uh, kill somebody with the left hand or, or, or what's going on there? Um, basically, in the Hyoho Kata, uh, in the, the Nito Seho, the two sword work, we use the short sword uh, to suppress the opponent's actions and to suppress their position. Um, this is not to say that you can't cut and kill somebody with the sword in the left hand, because of course you can. Um, and just because what we do in the kata is that suppressive work it doesn't mean that, uh, just like with Mujirigamai, suppressions are done in kata to the sword, um, but it should always be taken that you can suppress the body with the same method, right? And of course, if you begin to suppress somebody's body with the sword, you're, you're causing damage to them, um, unless you're, you're doing it through pressure, through semi. Um, but the effect is still kind of the same. Um, so, why, right? Why train with a sword in both hands? Um, he lays it out. The goal is to learn how to use a sword in one hand freely. And uh, in the same way that we have... We, we don't want to overemphasize or, or become hyper-focused on training with one weapon. We also don't want to do that with our own body, right? We don't want to have some big monster right arm and like some tiny little weakling left arm, because what if we're injured, right? We need to be able to take the sword into the other hand and also use it one-handedly effectively. Um, so, why would you want to use a sword in one hand, right? Uh, most uh, traditional Koryu doctrine says, hey, 
this this sword is big. Uh, Japanese swords are heavy in comparison to uh, European or other Asian swords. So by necessity, we'll wield it with with two hands. Um, you know why? What would be the benefit of going against this sort of established idea? And he lays that out, right? He says, basically, um, hey, you know, that kind of two-handed sword work is great and fine, um, especially when you're working in sort of ideal conditions, or uh, let's say picturesque conditions, right? You versus one dude, right? Uh, where where he's directly in front of you and the terrain is is uh, sort of fair to middle in for both, right? This kind of uh, indoor work almost. Um, but that the moment you sort of break outside of that uh, that idea of battles happen in these sterile conditions and start going, well, that's cool. I'm running up this hill and I have to fight some dude while I'm on the hill, while I'm trying to run, what happens? Well, you know, it, you know, this is, this is one of the many points in Musashi's strategy that is, uh, it's really easy to test even for a lame person, right? Uh, just take a bouquet and try moving, right? Aggressively, right? Say, okay, I've got this river, I want to try and swim with the sword. Right. Again, judge your own skill level, right? If you can't swim, you know, use common sense, of course. Uh, but try doing things that are difficult. Try climbing. Try um, moving quickly from one point to another, even on sort of flat ground. If you've got uh, a big group of friends, try, you know, get them to kind of stand close together, bunched up like a crowd, and try and move through them holding the sword in two hands, holding it in one hand. And the the utility of this one-handed method will become clear. Um, it's especially clear when you start working against more than one person. Now, some of you have kata uh, that specifically use more than, than one attacker, uh, more than one uchidachi. Uh, in Hyoho, we don't have that. Uh, it's always sort of one-on-one -on -one in the kata. But uh, you extrapolate it to fighting multiple opponents, at which point using the sword in two hands suffers from the same problem that fighting with a sort of static stance uh, happens. Uh, we'll talk about that uh, more in just a little bit. So our goal is to use the sword freely in one hand. Uh, I guess we'll go ahead and cover the the stance thing now while it's fresh in the mind. So there's a simple idea when working against more than one opponent, and that is what works really good on one person. In other words, what gives you a lot of tactical advantage against one person doesn't always give you that same advantage to everyone. Um, a great example of this is boxing. Right now, boxing is is powerful. Right, it is a, a powerful, highly developed uh, method. Right, but because it is so highly developed and highly specialized for the for what it was for its purpose, right, to fight another guy in a ring and to just beat him unconscious, uh, it suffers. A little bit when you begin to open up against more than one person. Um, or rather, I should say, some of the strategic elements of boxing lose their their uh, their utility. So, for instance, uh, when we think of stance, right, in any kind of martial art, we, 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 we take our stance or, or, or we do whatever we do, you know, we, we take our kamai towards an opponent. That's real cool when you're working against one dude, right? And when you're working with one dude, you can start to do all sorts of 
really sort of subtle things with your position. You know what you have to guard against because you understand what a person in this relative forward position to you with the same tools that you have can attack you with, right? And so you can you can you can start to cover that lever, you can start to, to ward off with that lead hand. You you can really make it hard for them to work against you in a, in a way that uh, would give them easy advantage. But, because it's all focused in one direction, right, the moment that Bob or Fred or George comes here, right, what am I... If I fight to say, okay, well, i got to get into my position and then work, or I have to get into my position and then work, I'm losing time. And this position, which is so powerful against one person, and it is, right? Don't think I'm, I'm not disemboxing here, right? <laughs> um, if you're bound to that stance, to that Kamai, it breaks apart, right? And this is what Musashi's basically saying with the sword. It's like this method of using the sword where you can freely cut you know, on this vertical axis with ease falls apart when you're fighting more than one person where it becomes much more important to be able to work at wide angles from one side to the other to sort of shepherd your opponents into position as you move your position. Um, and we'll probably have, uh, we'll probably do a video just about the sort of methods and strategies for working against more than one person um, and we'll do it in a real sort of practical way, one that's easy to understand and easy to kind of implement in your own practice. Uh, well, <laughs> as easy as fighting against more than one person can possibly be, at least. So, moving on. Uh, one of the things that, one of the reasons Musashi additionally says, hey, you know, it's, you really want to be able to use a sword in one hand, is from just simple pragmatic utility. Um, and you gotta, for this, it helps to have a little bit of context about Musashi and his background. You know, this is a guy who went to war on several occasions, right? And though he is more famous for his kind of, uh, his, his individual duels or his, you know, his, his bouts outside of combat, he was still uh, focused as kind of the last generation of warriors that thought about combat on a grand scale, on this sort of siege type mentality. And so, um, in this kind of large-scale warfare, the sword is not necessarily the primary weapon. I mean, everybody's equipped with it because the sword is useful on the field, it's useful indoors, it's useful in cities, it's, it's, uh, because it sits in this sort of middle range of size for weapons, um, it has a lot of utility in pretty much every application. Um, but on the open battlefield, other weapons come into play, you know, spears and, and halberds and, and bows and guns, right? Uh, each with their own, their own benefits and drawbacks. And a, a samurai on the battlefield would not just be carrying, not just, a, it's a generalization, you understand. Uh, just their their long sword and their their backup sword, they're going to be carrying a bow, uh, a yumi or a yari a spear or a naginata or you know uh, tanigashima right the uh, matchlock, um, because those are weapons that are that give advantage in the field. Um, so you're you're hiking through, you got your pole arm and all of a sudden you're hit close, right? Well, you gotta draw your sword and work with it, because in close, halberds and spears start to fall apart the same as bows and rifles, and so you use the sword in that uh, sort of close range distance to work with them. And if you're, you're trying to... Your options are, do I drop this, draw this, and then use it, and hope that you know, that I'm not losing in that time, 
or do I already have it out? What am I working? How am I doing it? And Musashi says, you know, just simplify it. Learn how to use the sword in one hand, and it's not a problem because you solve all of these various considerations. Um, so, I mean, and that's that thinking about things in a, in a both a general sense and as they apply to sort of larger, more open field combat tactics um, is, is the flavor of this style, right? So where other styles are much more interested in defeating an opponent or two or three, right? In this sort of single combat, uh, <laughs> two or three opponents is still kind of single combat in, in Samurai era. Um, there's a different mindset, a, a focus towards more sophisticated technical work. Um, in the same way that boxing has its, its more sophisticated technical work um, than, say, like uh, Micmac, the, the Marine Corps combat system, or similar styles. So, um, it's useful to understand this oh, in that it gives you the, the lens to look through. It's like, okay, well, this is why we don't have, you know, 113 kata. This is why we don't have uh, any type of uh, bato or, or ei, right? No, tri no drawing work beyond just drawing both the swords out at once. Um, so it, it's, it's useful in that it gives you perspective and you see sort of, you know, is this method suitable, a suitable solution to your goal, right? Because as, as martial practitioners, it's very important that we uh, have a very clear goal in mind for what we want from our training, right? Um, and unfortunately, I think this lack of goal uh, people say, oh, well, my goal is I want to do martial arts. It's like, well, that's cool, right? There are lots of martial arts. Tai Chi is a martial art, right? Sandan is a martial art, right? It, there's, it, it really varies as to what you're going to get out of it, what you're interested in. And uh, not having a goal kind of can lead instructors and purveyors of martial arts to try and make their martial arts something that fits everybody's want, right? And so you'll have, uh, you know, choosing one at random, a karate guy, and he says, oh, you know, yes, my style is, is old and historical, so you've got this sort of cultural aspect, it, it has a competition aspect, it's got beautiful forms for for public demonstration and it's the greatest self-defense method ever made you know it's just trying to be everything to everyone and uh, in my opinion the the arts suffer from it, right they they are not enhanced by this trying to be more um, but it's a bit of a digression so, back to our work, right? So he, he's laid out, you know, why we call it Nito, uh, the advantages to doing it, and and basically why why you should, in his opinion, do it. Immediately after that, he goes in to say, but hey, this is going to be hard. You're not going to be strong. You're not going to be coordinated. It's going to take time, right? Um, because again, the Japanese sword is is a heavy sword by comparison, and even uh, sort of older swords, tachi, which tend to be lighter because they were used primarily one-handed because they were a cavalry weapon. Um, they they have a, an ungainliness to them until you get trained, right? It's not like uh, picking up, like, a, a saber, uh, like a shashka from Russia or some of the Hungarian sabers. You pick it up, and right away you go, oh, yeah, using it is intuitive, right? The katana is not necessarily a very intuitive weapon. 
Um, so it's going to take time. You're going to have to work, right? Now, is it worth that effort? Well, it's up to you, right? Because it's not like the the sword community has only grown um, with the internet. I mean, it's it's very easy, or at least it's it's much easier than it was when I was starting to connect to instructors in in a method that you're interested in. It's not like oh, well, the, the only sword fighting style here is this, so I guess I'm learning Olympic fencing, right? You can, you can really uh, choose what you want, right? So, uh, speaking of choosing, the last little section of this, he says, basically, what's important is that each person has a sword that is suitable for them, right? And he, he goes on to specifically say that, or imply, rather, that suitability is a matter of matching the sword to the person's physical strength, right? Um, so what does this mean? Uh, do we want to have heavier swords instead of lighter swords? You know, a lot of people uh, misread the section in the Gorin no Show that has to do, it's a, it's a very brief section, on uh, Musashi's thoughts on people's swords and, and the swords that they should have. And they get this idea that what Musashi wants you to use, or what he, he advises that you use in his strategy, is the biggest, meatiest, heaviest sword that you can wield efficiently. And that is, uh, that is simply not the case. Um, what Musashi's interested in is that you have a sword that is well made, right, sturdy, and that it cuts strongly. Now this idea of cutting strongly is, is unfortunately beyond the scope of, of words. Like I could talk about it for 15 minutes and still not really convey anything about it. So we're gonna leave it aside for now and um, that's that, right? <laughs> um, so, if Musashi's not advocating that you get a heavier sword if you're stronger, what's he advocating? Right? He's saying, basically, if your strength is high, you can wield a longer weapon. Right? Um, or if your strength's low, then you need to wield a shorter weapon. That's it. Right? It's... It's like so much of uh, Musashi's writings, and really Koryu in general, um, it's, it's much simpler than it at first seems, right? Everyone wants to go down these rabbit holes about things, and it's like, no, 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 you, you missed the point, right? If you're strong, you can wield a longer sword. If you're not strong, you need to wield a shorter sword. What's important is that you wield a sword that you can wield well, right? Now, in training, practice with a heavy sword, right? Because, uh, Sashi says, you know, hey, if you want to know how to cut, right, cut as if you're using a heavy sword. So if you're practicing, why not use a heavy sword so that you know how to cut, right? And then let that be your, your, your built-in sort of muscle memory, right? Plus, by using a heavier sword, you become stronger and can use a longer sword, um for your actual work. Uh, now, uh, in the Go Rin No Show, uh, in, in the Book of Wind, or tradition, he has uh, sections against people that train with really long swords and people that train with shorter swords. And so, again, this sort of adds to that confusion, like, well, if he wants my swords not to be too long and not to be too short, then I'm in this middle range, then the only way I get stronger, more robust swords is by getting heavier. And that kind of builds into that mistaken idea. What he's saying in those sections is not long, longer than average swords are bad and shorter than average swords are bad. What he's specifically saying is that combative methods that rely on your sword being long 
aren't really useful, right? They're weak because you're just trying to gain advantage on somebody because your sword's a little bit longer, right? Well, what happens if that longer sword, which has more leverage stress placed on it in time it's struck or you strike something dumb, right? What if it breaks? And now suddenly you're, you're cut off with something that's maybe two shaku, right? <laughs> at, at two feet, roughly, right? Now you can't win because your, your weapon's longer. But if you get attacked while you're like sweeping your garage, like, oh, well, I'm gonna use my, ah, oh, shit. My broom is not four shaku long. I will never beat my opponent. He's saying that this type of strategy is, is retarded, right? You should be able to win by any means. And it's the same with shorter swords, uh, though his criticism of why people choose shorter swords is different, of course, you know, in that people choose shorter swords, shorter than, than average, with this idea that they can move faster, right? That they can, they can flit, they can dodge, that they can, you know, move in and around people with, with greater ease. And again, this is, it's weak and it's impractical, right? Um, going fast, I've said this so many times, going fast for fast's sake, is not good, right? It, it leads your work to be coarse and sloppy and hollow and weak. And, you know, while going fast at somebody, uh, especially if they're not used to it, can startle them, can sort of uh, break their posture a bit. It, if you're working against somebody who knows what they're doing, they're just gonna collapse you, right? They're just gonna break you down and they can do so by going slow because of the difference in distance traveled, right? Um, and like I said, we've talked about this in lots of application videos, so uh, you either get it or you don't, right? Practice. <laughs> um, so again, use a sword that you can use well, you know, and that's, that's all well and good, but a lot of beginners, right, they have no idea what what a sword that they can wield well is. What does that mean? Um, so I'm gonna give you some guidelines. These aren't Kyoho specific. These are just observations that that I've had in you know my time training. If you can, uh, give me a second. I'll grab a sword and I'll demonstrate. <laughs> Okay, here we go. So, ideally, if you can pass your sword with a relaxed arm, not trying to stretch and reach, just soft and relaxed, and have it just barely miss the floor, that's about a good length blade for you to start off with. Of course, you can study and uh, you might find that this much sword is too much for you, you need a shorter one, or you might find that you can easily wield something this size, and so you'll, you'll get something bigger, right? Um, now, as for the ska length, I think that, again, you should be able to use a sword regardless of its uh, handle length, especially since we're working primarily one-handed. Uh, that being said, for doing the kata, for studying the subtler interactions in a person's form, in your form as you, you power into the cut, as you drive the opponent around, uh, having a, a good-sized ska, not the super short ska that is typical for the Hyoho Boken is um, beneficial, I find. So as a general rule of thumb, right, let's say that this is my tsuba, right, I will bring my hand up to it, I will squeeze tightly. I will do a second hand, and I will do a third hand, right? And so from wherever the bottom of that third hand is to the tsuba, that is just about the perfect size for uh, beginners, right? From there, uh, you can, you know, go to a longer tska or a shorter tska as you, you're inclined to. Um, 
as a general rule, the shorter the ska, the faster the sword moves, right? Because you're, you're, even though we don't cut by creating a sort of an opposing center fulcrum, right? So that the point of rotation is in between our hands. We, we cut as though we're cutting with one hand, but because we have that back hand, um, sort of by necessity, the rotation point will be at the bottom of the back hand, not out of intention, but just as a side effect of good motion. Um, so the shorter that distance is, the faster the sword's gonna move. In contrast, the longer that ska is, the easier it is to feel the opponent's motion, right? When you're in contact with them, whether their body or their sword. Um, and I tend in my practice to put more emphasis on this feeling the opponent's form rather than uh, just hit him and hope for the best. Um, and that's, that's not to criticize the way it's, it's traditionally done. Um, it's just, that's a matter of my preference, right? My taste. So, um, and I think we talked about this in the equipment video, um, but whether you use a tsuba or not on your boken doesn't really matter. Whether you use a tsuba or not on your sword doesn't really matter. Um, and people might be throwing up their hands, oh my gosh, right? And all Japanese long swords have tsuba. It's like most, absolutely. 99, 99% 9, 9%, right, have tsuba. But uh, in the way that we use the sword, they're not necessary, right? Um, they're helpful, right? Because they stop your hand from sliding down on the blade, especially on a lot of these uh, one-handed thrusts that we do. Um, but you don't need it. I mean, you can look at uh, the Tensho style Koshirai mountings, and there are, again, a lot of examples of long swords with no suba. So it is a matter of personal preference. Um, you know, choose what you like. I will say that having a suba on both your boken and your sword is uh, very useful when you're starting out um, because it gives you a reference point that you don't have to think about, right? It's like, okay, well, there's the tsuba, right? If my hand's here, I know my tenochi is bad. If my hand's here, it's also not real great, right? And so I find that happy medium to grip the sword well, right? So that is the first article, right? Um, it's pretty simple, pretty straightforward, uh, but it's a good foundation piece. Um, next week, or next video, we'll look at the second article. So, as always, if you want to understand this work, you have to pick up a sword and go train.